Okay, all right. So in prevalence meta-analysis, what we're trying to do is to take prevalence estimates from different studies and pull them together. And, and a good example might be, I think one of the groups is looking at the prevalence of one particular cancer across different countries, right? So the most important consideration that you should ask yourself first is what is the right study to pull? Right, because you might be able to obtain prevalence estimates from different studies. And the trick here is that some studies might have, um, might actually say prevalence of this in this, right? And you might be able to pull those studies. But there might be studies where they don't explicitly say that they're assessing the prevalence. They might just say, oh, they're looking at the proportion or it might be a study that's looking at something else, but they are reporting the prevalence as part of the analysis. So th that's another study you might consider including. But the more critical thing that I want to say is that whatever study that you do include, whether it's a study that explicitly says that they're assessing prevalence or they don't say that they're assessing prevalence, you need to make sure that those studies, they're meaningfully representative of the population they are drawn from, okay? And this is not a trivial issue because if you include studies that are not representative, um, you, there is a chance that you might, you know, you might be misleading the scientific community basically. So, so uh, bear that in mind as you include studies or you might, you know, um, include them in your main meta-analysis, take them out in sensitivity analysis and compare estimates. But think carefully about what you're including. Okay. All right, so to conduct a meta-analysis of prevalence, we really just do an inverse, inverse variance meta-analysis of the proportion. So a prevalence is a proportion. You're, you're looking at the number of cases divided by the total population, basically proportion. So, but the issue with proportions is that they are not truly continuous variables, right? They're not truly continuous variables. They are bound from zero to 100. And so that means that if you use the proportion the way it is, you're going to have some degree of skewing. You're going to have some degree of skewing. So what we, we often then do is, first of all, transform the proportion. So most often, maybe a logic transformation or a log transformation of the proportion. So when you transform the proportion, you will then obtain an estimate that is skewed. It will have go from negative infinity to zero to positive infinity. You know, um, that transformation allows you, because now you have variable estimates on both sides um, of a median, you know, then that allows you to be able to transform to be able to do a proper meta analysis that assumes continu continuous variable and then you can back transform it to obtain the the estimate that is meaningful for reporting okay all right so in this case i said there's different types of transformation in, that are be, that are used that can be used in r um but there is this meta prop statement that you can use to run the meta analysis of proportions. And basically, it's fairly similar to what we have done across all different meta analysis. You specify the data, you specify the n, which is the total number of, patient, of people in your population. The event is the number of people who have the outcome or who have the cases. This is stud lab, which is basically just study label. You know, in this case, you have called it author underscore year. You can call it whatever you want. And this is from the data that you're importing, right? And this SM is a summary measure. In this case, we're saying P logit. So we're telling R to transform it. You know, we're not giving R transform data. We're telling R to transform it. Um, and then we're using, then you can use a method, which is inverse, and you can specify whether you have one a fixed effects model or a random effects model, and then run it. Very simple, very, very simple. So R knows that this is a proportion, 
you know, prevalence is a proportion. And it also generates the weight. A common effects model is the same thing as a fixed effects model. Um, you know, um, so you will then look at each of the results, right? Each, each of the estimates and the confidence intervals, lower bound of the confidence interval for that study is so the upper bound. And this is the, the pooled effect estimate that we're interested in, you know, 0 0.3153, right? 13 studies, 11,100 11, people are in these populations that we have looked at, and they had 3,386 events. You know, so the common effect model, basically, um, this is the pooled estimate, 0 0.32. And we can also look at the I squared. The I squared here is 99%, which is very, very high. And um, yeah, and then it, tell, it gives us some details on what we're just looking at. Any questions? Anybody have any questions or do I need to explain this again? Is it perfectly clear? Sorry, I have a little question, sir. Yes, please. Um, by the explanation you made earlier, sir. Yeah. Um, in some studies, the major outcome is not to measure the prevalence of the study. However, yeah. in the reporting, they do report prevalence. So can you yes. use, can you, can you, uh, like kind of uh, uh, extract the prevalence there and and uh, put it and in. use that. Yes, oh. you can extract the prevalence there. So the thing with meta analysis is that the estimates that you do use doesn't necessarily be doesn't necessarily have to be the one that they are most interested in. As long okay. as you can extract that data from their paper, you can use it. You know, and as long as it's the correct data that you're extracting, yes, you can use. So if they have, if they have said, so I'll give you an example. Um, you do a study, say in Dar es Salaam, and you're looking at, maybe it's a cohort study, you're looking at over 10 years, how many people, right? How many people have, you know, how many people have, um, develop maybe gastric cancer, right? Among those who are running versus those who are not running. So you're looking at maybe sufficient physical activity to protect against gastric cancer. You know, and so you might then say that in this study, maybe in this study, they followed 500,000 people and they have some estimates. So yes, you're assuming that oh, maybe this is a fairly representative study. So you think that you can use it. The question then is that if they report that the total population is 500,000, I'm just guessing that's a very large study. And they then say that the incidence of gastric cancer or maybe the prevalence of gastric cancer in this study was, um, they might say maybe they, they identified 1,000 cases, right? So you can take the number of cases and divide that by the, um, by the total number of the population, if you assume that, um, so maybe they tell you that in one year, right? That's how you'd be able to use prevalence. So they might say that in the final year of the study, 1,000 cases of gastric cancer were identified and the total number of population was 500,000. And then you can calculate the prevalence in that final yeah. year of the study, you know, and use that here. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's well, how okay. it works. One more question, sir. Yeah. Um, regarding the number you, you, you've you been emphasizing on, I was kind of wondering whether if there's um, a threshold maybe or uh, a number below which um, uh, you are not supposed to include in your studies. For example, the sample size. Is there any limit for the sample size to include in your studies? No, there's no limit. There is no like, oh, it has to be too large or it has to be too small. No. The issue is that it should be representative of this of the population that it is coming from. Okay. Yeah. And there might be scenarios where it's not representative. And I'll give some examples. So if you have a case control study, right? 
it's tempting to look at a case control study and say that, oh, maybe we can use this, but that would be wrong. Because case control studies are not designed to be representative of the study of the population that they're coming from, right? Um, if you have maybe, there's some other designs that might be able to allow you, or, or if somebody says, for instance, that they're looking at the instance of gastric cancer. So let's take that gastric cancer example where you have 500,000 people in a city, right? And there are 1,000 cases of gastric cancer, okay? But somebody now tells you that, oh, you see that those 1,000 cases of gastric cancer that we have data on, it's not, this is not all the cases of gastric cancer possible in the city. This is only the cases of gastric cancer among those who were HIV positive. You know, so it might be the case that maybe HIV positive patients, they have beta, we have better data on them. And that's often the case in many of us, in many African settings, right? So we have better data on patients who are HIV positive. And in a cohort of 100,000 HIV positive patients, we are identifying 1,000 gastric cancer cases. Right, you cannot assume that those 1,000 gastric cancer cases represent all the gastric cancer cases in the 500,000 people in the city, right? Because that is not representative of the entire city. It is representative of the HIV population alone. And that's an important factor to bear in mind. And that's where I think a lot of people often go wrong in trying to do a prevalence meta-analysis. You have to read the methods carefully and look at how did they select the populations? Who did they kick out? Who did they exclude? Who did they include? And that will determine whether you can in include that study you know, in your own study or not. So it has to be representative of the population that you're looking at, okay? So that's the key thing about prevalence method analysis. And then you can take this prevalence method analysis and run a forest plot. So if you run this plot, and in this case, I'm asking it to use the Revman, um, Revman layout, and it looks like it's chopping off at the edges. I need to fix that. Um, there's, there should be some code to make this font smaller. We'll fix that later. Um, but if you look at this plot, right? Um, let me let me see if I can just run the code, the, run this in a way that might be easier to look at. Yeah, it's the same thing. I'm not sure why that is. Um, so I think so, it has to do with the with the font. Maybe yeah, I think it's the font size. Yes. Um, yeah. But if you, so you're right. So if you look at this forest plot, however ugly it looks, you can see that this is the, the line of um, the pulled estimates, right? This is the diamond that we're looking at, um, 0 0.32. So this is 32%. The prevalence here is 32%. Um, and we have some studies on the right of it, and we have some studies on the left of it, you know, and the confidence interval. Notice here that we don't have a line of no effect because the line of no effect is not relevant in a meta-analysis, a prevalence meta-analysis. What's relevant is that line of the pulled effect, which is this one. Okay. So, so this is prevalence meta-analysis. So we can do a, um, a forest plot. We can also do a funnel plot to examine publication bias. You know, so this is the line of no of pulled of the pulled effect as well. We have some studies on the right of it. We have some studies on the left of it. Okay, but we can see here that there is asymmetry. Some stu these studies on this right side are so much more than the studies on the left side. Right, so it might suggest to us that there are some studies on this left side that we're missing, right? Because that's why we have asymmetry. And we can use trim and fill to try to guess 
how many papers are missing? What would they look like? And we can ask it to generate a forest plot for what that would have looked like, <laughs> okay? If those studies were included. So this is the chairman field. It tells us that initially we had 13 studies, but now it has added six studies on the other side, right? So we now have nine studies and it tells us that if we run a model for these nine studies that is, it is guessing, this, it's guessing these six studies, it's not, um, it's not like this is an absolute, right? So this would have obtained a pooled effect estimate that looks like this with the confidence interval, okay? And if you look at the summary, summary of the results, there's a list of the studies that are included. There is also a list of studies where it is guessing. So it's guessing that on the other side of where Banning Bay was, there's another study that looks like Banning Bay, but on the left side, right? Basic, so that's essentially the same thing. It's trying to create a balance, mirror images of the studies that exist. And if you look in the forest plot, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. This is the forest plot that we had before, and it's creating mirror images of these other studies on the left side to try to find a balance. So here it's telling us, it's indicating that these are not the real ones, so it's not shaded. So that's trim and feel. Um, we've seen that in previous classes as well. 